Hey church family, Pastor Dean Ross here. So grateful you're joining us for this FC Equip session. This is part three of Community Meals. Just to recap, what are Community Meals? Community Meals are a strategy for engaging your church family and the surrounding community, especially those who don't know Jesus or have a local church to call home. Community Meals are simple, eat, fellowship, and share the love of Jesus. Most of us, we eat and we fellowship naturally. That's what we do in New Orleans, whether it's crawfish boils or going to restaurants or having people over for dinner. Especially in our city, we know how to eat and fellowship naturally. It's what we do. It's who we are. There doesn't have to be anything awkward about it. Simply invite people where you live, work, eat, or play to, to dinner or coffee or somewhere public for the purpose of sharing genuine friendship and genuine table fellowship with them, but also sharing the love of Jesus. And so over these sessions, we're going to talk about the, the theological. And if you don't know what theology means, it basically just means what we believe. So the biblical reason we believe meals are so important to share, and then also how to share Jesus and how to invite people to Jesus without it being awkward or unnatural. So we're going to look today, if you want to go ahead and pause the video, if you need to grab a Bible or look up on your phone, we're going to be in Luke chapter 9 verses 7 through 20. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start reading. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard all about what was happening and he was perplexed. And, and let me stop there. When he says he heard all about what was happening earlier in Luke, Jesus had already had come on the scene and he was performing miracles. He was healing people. These crowds were following him. He actually, just before this, takes uh, his, his disciples and he sends them off two by two on mission. And so what we see here is that now Herod hears about all this and he was perplexed because it was said by some that John, talking about John the Baptist, had been raised from the dead. And Herod had actually just put John the Baptist to death and beheaded him. And by some that Elijah, the Old Testament prophet, had appeared, but by other that one of the prophets of old had risen, possibly Moses, Abraham, one of the old prophets in the Old Testament. Herod said, John, I just beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. And on their return, talking about the apostles' return uh, away from their missionary journey that Jesus had just sent them on, on their return, the apostles told him all that they had done. And he, talking about Jesus, took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. And when the crowds learned it, they followed him and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God. And he cured those who had need of healing. And now the day began to wear away and he said to them, Send the and, and, and the twelve, talking about the disciples, came to him and they said to Jesus, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we're here in a desolate place. But Jesus, he says to them instead, You give them something to eat. And the apostles responded, they said, We have no more than five loaves or two fish unless we're to go and buy some food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Maybe you've heard this passage called the feeding of the 5,000. Get this. There was 5,000 men, likely 15 to 20,000, maybe even more people that were here following, that were following Jesus to hear from him. They were interested in him. And he said to the disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so, and he had them all sit, and they had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to, into heaven and said a blessing over them. Let's talk about Jesus. And he broke the loaves and he gave it to the disciples to set before the crowd, and they all ate and they were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up twelve baskets of broken pieces. Now it happened that as they were playing, praying alone. The disciples were with him, and he said to them, this is after the feeding, Jesus says to them, Who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and the others also say one of the prophets of old that had risen. And he said to them, But who do you say I am? And Peter answered, The Christ. 
of God. Just to let you know some background information, Christ, it, the word means anointed one. It's really the word we get Messiah from. And so the Old Testament Jews were anticipating this coming Savior, this coming Messiah. And so Jesus here is answering that. So what stood out? What stood out in this? What Might, might it be that there's so little amount of food, but all these people get fed by this little amount of food? Jesus miraculously multiplies these things. What questions do you have? Well, how did this happen? Why? What, what, what does the story about Herod questioning who Christ is have to do with the feeding of the 5,000? Think about what questions do you have. Now think about the context. And we looked at the context, and we said the context was Jesus was having his public ministry, and people were beginning to think, okay, who is this guy? Who is this guy, and what is he doing? What does it say about God? What does it say about us? It says that God's the provider, and and we can trust in him for his provision. Maybe when we look at him breaking the bread and passing it out, maybe maybe it ends up symbolizing what he was going to do with his body being broken. And we, we remember Jesus through communion nowadays where we break the bread and we drink the wine and we remember his sacrifice made for us. What is the application? One that we can trust Jesus, that we remember him and his sacrifice. We do that when we gather together with the church. So ask these questions. Whenever you read any passage of scripture, what stood out? What questions do you have? What is the context? What does it say about God? What does it say about us? What is the application? I, like I've said before, feel free to pause the video or rewind if you need to get those. So pause right now if you need and write down what stood out. What questions do you have? What is the context? What does it say about God? What does it say about us and what is the application? So here we see, and Tim Chester points out in his book, A Meal with Jesus, he says in verses 7 through 9 of this passage, Luke gives us three possible answers to the question of Jesus' identity. We get the same three options at the very end when, Luke, when, when Jesus asked the question of his disciples in verses 18 through 20. And their answers are this, a new John, a new Elijah, or a new prophet of old, like a new Moses. And right in the middle of this, Luke places the story of the feeding of the 5,000 men. Why? Because this feeding provides the critical clue for the identity of Jesus. Our topic today is that community meals mirror hope. The feeding of the 5,000, uh, the answer to the feeding of the 5,000 tells us who Jesus is. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ of God. He's the hope for humanity. Meals show us the hope that we have in Christ and the hope that we can extend to other people. Tim Chester furthermore writes in his book, A Meal with Jesus. He writes, our world is a world of hunger, pain, suffering, and want. Even in neighborhoods where most people have enough to eat, we still live in want. We're still unsatisfied. We may not long for bread, but we all long for meaning, intimacy, fulfillment, community, and purpose. The Christian community is the beginning and sign of God's coming world. And no more so than when we eat together. Our meals are but a foretaste of the future messianic banquet that we're all promised. You read the book of Revelation. Uh, there's, there's depicted in the book of Revelation this marriage supper of the Lamb where every tribe, nation, and tongue come together. And I firmly believe the Cajuns are going to help help our Messiah cater because the food's got to be really, really good. But this is going to be a meal like no other. Meals are important because they show our dependence on God. Some of us, we might have grown up with our parents teaching us to say prayers before our meal, to say a blessing over our meal. Truth is, we don't bless the meal. It's, it's, it's God who blesses the meal. But when we say that prayer, that blessing before a meal, it's acknowledging our dependence and our need on Jesus to provide the daily bread that we have. So if you're sitting at a restaurant uh, ordering a meal that you just ordered, or you're at home and you and, and your family have just prepared a meal, be thankful for the people who prepared it. Be thankful ultimately for the God who gave you the money and the resources to eat such a, 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 a feast of food. 
And we all have to be thankful that even if we're not eating what we want, we are so blessed to have food on our table because not everybody in our world has such a privilege. The, the, the Bible points to the future. And the future of, of meals in the church is that one day, at the end of time, we're going to all gather together and we're going to feast together. The book of Isaiah chapter 25 verses 6 and then 8 through 9 shares this vision of this great messianic banquet, this marriage supper of the Lamb that we all who follow Jesus will experience together. It says, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, marrow of aged wine well refined. Get that. It's rich food and good wine. Jesus is bringing the best to the party. The marriage supper of the Lamb is going to have the best of the best. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It, was said on, it will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Meals remind us of the hope that we have in Jesus, because not only are we dependent upon his provision to have food at the table, but even the opposite, when we're fasting and we're praying and we're getting rid of food to focus on Jesus, we are furthermore reminded of our dependence upon God and dependence upon his substance to get us through life and its struggles. And so may we never forget that food is a sign of the hope that we have in Jesus. And may, may we show the hope that we have in Jesus through the meals that we share with other people. Now I want to encourage you, like I have every week, to make a, make a list of four people in your life, where you live, where you work, where you eat, and where you play, who don't know Jesus or don't have a local church. Maybe you don't even know that well. I want to encourage you to write those down right now, and we're going to pause the video if you need. Write them down, and we are going to pray over those right now. And I would encourage you to go ahead and start doing meals. Invite someone. Invite someone to your home. Go out to a restaurant with someone. Have your family get together and throw some sort of feast. Invite someone and begin to share the love of Jesus with them through fellowship and with word and with truth. Let me pray for you right now. God, I pray for the, the list that we have. I pray for the list of the people that we know that need you, that we write down here every week. God, I pray right now that you would be preparing the hearts of the people that we are prepared to feast with. God, help us to show your love boldly. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Now, we've been talking about the Three Circles Life Conversation God. I encourage you, if you don't have one of these, you can pick up one at Family Church, or you can go online, Google uh, Three Circles Life Conversation God. There are free resources online. This is a good, this is not a gospel track that you hand to someone. It's just a tool for you to better understand how to share your faith. And the three circles method is what we've been using. And the first circle is God's design. The second circle is brokenness. And the third is gospel. And last, last session, uh, in session two, we talked about God's design. This session, we're going to talk about brokenness. So brokenness is a result of sin. And in the three circles, God, it describes brokenness in this way. Life doesn't work when we ignore God and his original design for our lives. We selfishly insist on doing things our own way. The Bible calls this sin. We all sin and distort God's original design for us. The consequence of our sin is separation from God. In this life and for all of eternity, sin leads to a place of brokenness. And we see that all around us in our own lives as well. When we realize that life is not working, we begin to look for a way out. We begin to go in many directions trying to find different things to figure it out on our own. Brokenness leads us to a place of realizing our need for something greater. This is the pivotal point that we use to share the love of Jesus. Our world knows the world's not supposed to be as it is, whether it's disease, whether it's racism, whether it's uh, the economy struggling. Our world knows 
that things aren't supposed to be the way they are, but we can't fix those things on our own. The only hope that we have is Jesus, and we're going to get to that next week when we talk about the gospel. Now to close out our session, we've been wanting to pick a topic every week that you may get when you're sharing Jesus. It's what we call in seminary terminology or theological terminology, we call it apologetics. That's where we get the word apology from. It means that we are ready to defend what we believe. And so one topic that I want to talk about this week is, can I trust the Bible? Can I trust the Bible? I would encourage you to look up a good resource about where did the Bible come from? I know J.I. Packer has a really good book on how do we get the Bible. Uh, if you need more resources on how did we get the Bible, what books were not included, can we trust the books that were included, all of that, feel free. I've written an entire paper on it and have resources. Feel free to email, email us at connect at jointhefamily.church and I'll send you what I have. So connect at jointhefamily.church. You can go to our website and just click the contact, the connect link, and I would love to send you those resources. But just to share a, a, a few quick things with you. Know this, that we have more manuscripts of the, of the, you know, the Bible's broken into the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is not debated at all. Like the Old Testament is 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 pretty set in stone we we jews acknowledge the old testament christians acknowledge the new testament now protestants uh have and, and jews have less books than catholics have in the old testament that's called the apocrypha and my very quick note on the apocrypha is there as long as you read it just um just uh, just to read it, there's nothing really damaging about it. I wouldn't form any doctrine around it because it, these are kind of some disputed books and not all across all of his, history of Christianity have they been accepted. Not bad to read. I just wouldn't form all doctrine around it, but we can trust the books that we do have. The 66 books of the Old Testament and the New, we can trust every single book one of them. And, and there's a way that we got those books. One, we have ancient manuscripts. I don't know if you know this, the Bible is the historically the most well-attested ancient book in history. It can be trusted. Uh, in fact, we get most of our Roman history from Tacitus, and we only have two surviving manuscripts of Tacitus's Roman history, including the most ancient, other than the Bible, the, the most ancient book that we have most manuscripts of is Homer's The Iliad, and we have 643 manuscripts of that. Do you know the New Testament alone, we have at least, if not many more, over 5,000 completed manuscripts or partial manuscripts of all the New Testament. We have many more documents that support the New Testament. The New Testament is not only, it is the most well-attested uh, document, historical ancient document in history. You can trust the Old and New Testament that they are God's word. The Bible says that all scripture is God breathed. So Men, we did not deliver these words. We, Mankind, men and women, we didn't give these words. These words came under direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit over thousands and thousands of years. Now, there's five different criteria for what ended up in the Bible. Now, the, here's the five I want to share with you. One, the book had to be authoritative. It means that it had to have the authority. It had to have be written by someone who was an eyewitness of the account. It means the New Testament, these were people who knew Jesus, who walked with Jesus, who experienced the miracles of Jesus. These are eyewitnesses of Jesus. It had to be authoritative. Two, it had to be authentic. It had to be proven. It had to be, um, it had to be prophetic. It had to be something that spoke to God's law and God's goodness and God's grace. It and then thirdly, it had to be consistent. It had to fit in with the rest of God's word. It couldn't say anything off the wall. In fact, there's a there's a, a book in the that didn't get included in any hardly any uh, Christian New Testaments that was found many years later as the Gnostic writing called the Gospel of Thomas. And the last verse in that reads, Peter basically I'm paraphrasing here, but Peter asked Jesus, "How shall women enter the kingdom of heaven?" 
Or how shall Mary enter the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus says, only unless a woman humbles herself or Mary humbles herself and becomes a man, shall she enter the kingdom of God. Becomes like a man, shall she enter the kingdom of God. Well, there's a reason the gospel of Thomas no, got no nowhere near being included in the gospel. One, it wasn't written by Thomas. And it was written hundreds of years after the apostles had died. And so the Bible that you have is well attested. It's true. It's consistent. Also, it's universal. It's universally accepted. It means that there's nobody questioning that should this book be in there or should this book not be in there. The 66 books of our Bible that we have are attested. They are they are thousands and thousands of Christians for millions of Christians for generations have have attested to them and know that they are true. And lastly, they're spiritual. There's something about the Bible. We don't read the Bible. The Bible reads us. In fact, I've known people that have read the Bible and the Spirit comes and saves them through the reading of God's Word. You don't hear this with other ancient documents. There's something spiritual about the Bible. Now, we worship the, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And the Bible is not God. It's not a member of the Trinity, but the Bible is God's words to us. They're completely authoritative. They're completely inerrant, infallible, and we can trust those words. And so I'd ask you, are you reading your Bible? The best way you can answer the question, can I trust the Bible, is through your story that you share with other people of saying, you know what? Jesus says that all those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Romans 10, 13. I called upon the name of the Lord in my lowest time or my most self-indulgent time, and he saved me, and here's how. How do you know the Bible is true? Well, we live out God's words, and so I want to encourage you to live faithfully for Jesus. If you have any other questions, please contact us at jointhefamily.church. We would love for you to join us. We would love for you, if you don't have a church home, to become part of a church family. Please connect with us. We want to walk you on the journey of becoming more like Jesus. I encourage you to share meals. Share, share meals. Encourage, connect with other people. Point them to Jesus and his church. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you for those who are listening today. God, I pray blessings over them right now. God, I pray as we read your word, and even today as we read the story of who do you say that I am? Because that's the most important question that we'll answer. God, and as we looked at the feeding of the 5,000, Lord, we, we're reminded that our hope is in you and that when we share meals and we share life with other people, they see hope in you through us as we show our faith in you and as we love people just as you have have loved us. So God, help us to love you passionately and love others personally. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. God bless.